Have you had unprotected contact with an anonymous tick? So what we have here about animal-borne diseases like leptospirosis, leptospirosis spirochete is a spirochete which basically grows inside the proximal convoluted tubule of rats. Now for you and me, leptospirosis is an infection that causes liver and kidney and liver and kidney and kidney and liver and liver and kidney. But for the rat, it's pyelonephritis. It is basically rat pyelonephritis that gets transmitted to human beings as an incidental host. It's rat tubule infection, rat pyelonephritis, that the rat urinates on your food and you go, mmm, these taste like the urine of rat. Very nice. So you have to have animal exposure in history or you won't be able to get this illness. It's food contaminated by the wrong urine or feces of the animals since they're close to each other. Fever, well this is the infectious disease section, so saying something that has a fever is nothing special. Even fever and abdominal pain. Now well, what becomes special, what becomes different and unique, what is different and unique, what gives me the answers that I seek and is different and unique is muscles, muscle pains. So you get severe myalgias that tells you also the high CPK, but because of this organism is a spirochete. Can you diagnose spirochetes with a gram stain? No, because -uh, it's a too small, and that's why in syphilis we diagnose it with serology called VDRL and FTA. RPR, MHATP, and here we have a version of serology for leptospirosis, but also because culture can actually be dangerous for people because there are some spores that can cause a pneumonia for people. Oh, let's look here. It's a different one, cystic cirrhosis. And remember, for leptospirosis is also penicillin. It's one of the few uses for a good old-fashioned penicillin G. Now, cysticercosis with the emphasis on the cysts. It's a brain that looks like a pizza. When the moon hits your brain like a big pizza pie. And it shows thin walls. It says cysticercosis. Cysticercosis comes entirely out of uninspected meats because the organism gets into the meats and you don't throw it away. So uninspected meats, not in supermarkets, usually in places where they still sell in the carniceria and in places where you have open mercados. And what do you say, mm, what's that tasty thing I taste in the meat sauce? It's cysts. And so it's transmitted by, ooh, that's it, that's the little bastard right there. And what happens is that this is actually the cyst that actually bites on and latches onto you. It latches onto you and crawls inside your guts and goes up into your brain. So cysticercosis, when it's like this, these are not active lesions. These are old calcified lesions. And old calcified lesions don't need albendazole except if there's actual worms in them. If it's inactive calcifications where people are presenting with seizures, cysticercosis is a common cause of seizures. Then it happens that you see that you see just calcifications without a worm inside there. Tasty. Mm, yeah, unexpected meats. More tick-borne diseases. Guess which one this is. There is the target of that, excuse me, the target of that Lyme. And if you see that Lyme rash, you go straight to treatment. See the Lyme rash, you go straight to treatment. You don't need to use serology. You don't need to use Western blots or ELISAs. You don't need to use Western blots or ELISAs. You go straight into amoxicillin, doxycycline, amoxicillin, doxycycline, amoxicillin, doxycycline. And the third choice of therapy for that Lyme rash is cefuroxime. What generation does cefuroxime belong to? Cefuroxime is a second generation cephalosporin, cefuroxime. What happens if you're allergic to penicillin, you have a rash to penicillin, you don't want to give doxycycline to a child? Cefuroxime. So you're going to look for campers and hikers. Hikers and campers. Your mother was a camper and your father, he hiked her who has unprotected contact with an anonymous tick, and you have the Lyme rash. Now remember, 
very small number of people. Remember the lime tick because the Ixodes scapularis, the artist formerly known as Damini, Ixodes scapularis ticks are so small that even if you have an engorged nymph, it's so small you don't remember it. But the Lyme rash, when it occurs, is actually more specific than serology. That's one of the things about Lyme rash. It's so characteristic that the, so this is more precise than the serology. And sometimes called erythema migrans, it's not a great name, it means red skin that moves. Now the spirochete transmitted by this Ixodes tick, ooh, here's a bunch of examples of this. And if you have this rash or joint pain or facial palsy, if you have just the rash, joint pain or facial palsy, you can be treated with oral therapy, doxycycline, amoxicillin, or cefuroxime. Cefuroxime, doxycycline, or amoxicillin. If you have a Lyme rash, the joint pains or facial palsy, seventh cranial nerve palsy. Now, when you have a target shaped lesions, this is more specific. <coughs> and you don't have to do serology when you have a target lesion. When, okay, you should go straight to therapy. Where you have to do serology, the ELISA and the Western blot and serology, is when you have the facial palsy or the joint pain or the cardiac problems because there's lots of causes of AV block. You're not going to jump straight to say, hey man, that AV block must be Lyme. You have to confirm that. There's lots of causes of joint pain. You're not going to go first and say, hey man, that joint pain is Lyme. There's lots of causes of meningitis. You're not going to first say it's Lyme. So in fact, anything except the rash needs to be confirmed with serology. Anything except the rash needs to be confirmed with serology. But when you have a rash, go straight into treatment. Now this is the tick, and what happens when you see the tick? Do ticks need prophylaxis? And tick bite prophylaxis is only under very specific circumstances. Number one, you know when it's an exodes tick, not only that, and not only do you know it's an exodes tick, but you know it's an exodes tick that's an engorged nymph. And not only do you know it's an engorged nymph and it's an exodes tick, but it is a tick that's engorged in a nymph that's in an area with a lot of Lyme. And even on top of that, you have to say, you know what, this tick has been on you for at least 24 to 36 hours. That's a lot of requirements to say to need prophylaxis. You have to have an area in which there's endemicity of Lyme. You have to have an exodes tick. It has to be an engorged nymph, which is the one that transmits. And it has to be on you for 24 hours. Wow. Jeez, man. This is a difficult circumstance. This is like trying to, trying, to get in a, you know, trying to get in a bed with a virgin that's mother is watching. This is a lot of difficulty. It's a lot of requirements to say that needs prophylaxis. But that's the criteria. Endemic area, 24 hours of attachment, engorged nymph. Then you use prophylaxis. The long-term complications, joint pain is the most common. 60% of untreated Lyme from the rash will go on to develop joint pain. Serology, which means IgGs, ELISA's Western blots, ELISA's Western blots, and then oral therapy. Cardiac, any cardiac lesion should get intravenous ceftriaxone. Confirm with serology, ceftriaxone, AV block, it's the most common cardiac abnormality. Neurological, the most common neurological abnormality with Lyme is facial palsy. Facial palsy. See that tick? It's so small. So that's why we're not going to use prophylaxis most of the time. Serology, IgGs, ELISAs, and Western blot confirm it. And you use oral therapy for rash, the joint, the facial. And for cardiac Lyme or for CNS Lyme, we're going to use intravenous ceph. Triaxone. Does the seventh cranial nerve palsy need IV ceftriaxone, the facial palsy? No, because facial palsy is not, facial palsy is not part of the central nervous system. So say you'd use intravenous ceftriaxone if it is Lyme meningitis. CNS or cardiac is IV ceftriaxone.
axon, and a cranial nerve does not count as part of the central nervous system. Babesia, like American malaria. Babesia causes hemolysis. Babesia, seen as rings and crosses inside red cell. Babesia, treated with azithromycin and atovaquone. Babesia, comes out of the same sick tick that transmits Lyme, the exodes tick. Three things can come out of this exodes tick. Babesia, Lyme, and what's the third thing that comes out of the same sick tick? It is Ehrlichia. The three things that can come out of that exodes tick is Lyme, Babesia, and Ehrlichia. And Ehrlichia doesn't cause hemolysis, Babesia does. Ehrlichia doesn't, you don't see anything inside red cells, Babesia does. In Ehrlichia, you see morula in white cells, in Ehrlichia. Babesia red, Ehrlichia white. Babesia red and Ehrlichia white. This is hemolysis. How do you know it does not cause thing called malaria? because malaria looks different on the ring, and malaria is transmitted in hot countries with mosquitoes, whereas Babesia is a tick. So it's especially severe in asplenic patients because the spleen cleans out early infected red cells. The red cell gets infected, and a red cell membrane is kind of flexible. It kind of moves. And so when you get this infected red cell, it has bumps, bumps, bumps. And the bump, 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 bump of the red cell gets picked up by a person's spleen. And it gets pulled out of circulation before it can reproduce. So if you have no spleen, the Babesia will not get picked up and it can spread more. That's why asplenic patients have a problem with Babesia. Asplenic patients have more Babesia because the spleen removes infected cells. And therefore, when it sees that red cell with Babesia, the Babesia literally deforms, 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 puts a bump on the side of the red cell, which the spleen can detect and remove before it reproduces. And this is the so-called cross the so-called Maltese cross of the red cell cross with Babesia. That's why Babesia will go down as which of the following can be transmitted by blood transfusions, because you can actually get it from a blood transfusion. And the most accurate tests besides seeing it in the red cell is a polymerase chain reaction, PCR. Now, treatment for Babesia used to be quinine, used to be clindamycin and quinine, clinda, quinine, and now it is atovaquone and azithromycin. And that is because atovaquone and azithromycin have less adverse effects than the quinine. Quinine causes what problem? Quinine causes ringing in the ears. So I was once uh, looking at a certain medical school to go work. And uh, as per usual, uh, the guy in authority is frightened of me. Surprise, surprise. And he wasn't sure what to do, so he brings in the CEO of the medical school. The CEO of the medical school, it's a true story. Here I am, I'm at professor level. The guy sits down and he goes, how you doing? First thing out of his mouth is, What's the treatment for Babesia? I'm being pimped by the CEO of a medical school. And I go, uh, azithromycin and a tovaquone because quinine causes ringing in the ears and tinnitus. And the guy pulls out something out of his ear, which had been plugging up his ear. And he goes, you're absolutely right. They gave me quinine and my ears have been ringing ever since. You're hired. That's a true story. That's a true story. That's how I got the Turo. So, Azithromycin and atovaquone are the answer because they have the same efficacy.
and less adverse effects. Remember, efficacy comes first. Now, I told you that Babesia affects red cells and Ehrlichia affects white cells. Ehrlichia, Babesia, and Lyme are transmitted by the same Ixodes tick. But Ehrlichia does not have a rash. Ehrlichia is elevated LFTs, low whites, low platelets, LFT elevation. Low white, low platelets, and LFT elevation. And Ehrlichia, these things inside the white cells, these are called morula. These are morula, mulberries, growing mulberries inside your white cells. Those are morula. And the test is what you see on the smear as well as a PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Ehrlichia, sometimes also known as anaplasma. Ehrlichia or anaplasma phagocytophila. Ehrlichia or anaplasma and it's treated with doxycycline. Like a, thing, a lot of things, because this is a bit like rickettsia. Ehrlichia, rickettsia, rickettsia, ehrlichia, treated with doxycycline. So malaria, you see how it's a different ring? See it's a different type of ring? Let's go back to the ring, let's go back to that ring and show you the ring again. There's the Babesia ring. There's the Babesia ring, but it's not really a ring, is it? It's a cross. It's a cross, Maltese cross is there. Okay, it's a cross, but here's the ring of malaria. Now, you look for this in people returning from endemic areas because there's almost no domestically transmitted malaria. It's about 1,000 to 2,000 cases a year of malaria in the United States, and 95% of it is brought into the country as an import. So it causes fever and hemolysis. Fever and hemolysis, and how do you tell it's malaria? One is the blood smear. The second thing is you have to know that severe malaria, who gets treated for severe malaria? Because severe malaria, there's our mosquito. There's the malaria. Because severe malaria has to be treated, you see this word here, artesanates? also known as artethemer, arte, artesanates and artemether. Artesanates and artemether. So that's a new name for a lot of you, artesunates. Now, welcome to the big leagues because severe malaria is not treated predominantly with quinine and doxycycline. Severe malaria gets artesunates. You should write down a list of stuff you don't know so that you can look it up later. If you never heard of artesunates, you're not going to know off the top of your head. Now, severe malaria means that it's affecting people's brains and they have cerebral malaria. They're having a renal insufficiency because the hemolysis is causing renal damage, acidosis, CNS abnormalities, renal insufficiency, metabolic acidosis, severe malaria, or high levels, high percentage of parasitemias, severe malaria, CNS, severe malaria, low glucose, severe malaria, metabolic acidosis, severe malaria, or simply a high percentage of organisms inside people's bloodstream. Now for mild malaria, the same drugs work for prophylaxis as do for treatment. Mefloquine and atovaquone proguanol can be used for treatment and they can be used for prophylaxis. Atovaquone proguanol can be used for treatment and prophylaxis the same way in quinine can be used for treatment and for prophylaxis. Severe is with artesanates, and artesanates replace quinine and doxycycline. Now, mefloquine is the one that they're going to ask you the adverse effects because if they've got two drugs with the same efficacy, and mefloquine and atovaquone proguanol have pretty much about the same efficacy, so if they're both in the choice, and you have both mefloquine and atovaquone proguanol in the choice, it means you're missing the adverse effect, which is people with a history of psychiatric illness and depression, psychiatric illness and cardiac abnormalities. And if you have both of them in the question and they both have the same efficacy, look for the adverse effect, which is psychiatric disorder and cardiac abnormalities, which are the contraindications to mefloquine. 
Severe malaria means artemisinins, which is to say artestinate, as the single most effective thing. It's better than quinine and doxycycline. What do we mean by se severe? By severe, we mean that you have a super high level of parasitemia, greater than 5% parasites. The hemoglobin has damaged your kidney. The free hemoglobin damages your kidney and you get renal insufficiency. Metabolic acidosis, hypoglycemia, and people who have neuro, neurological cerebral malaria. That's how we know severe. What does severe mean? High parasite levels or brain and kidney abnormalities. That's when you're gonna say artesinates. Look it up, you're gonna feel really great. Remember, this is not just a bunch of test taking nonsense. You are now current. And if you wanna palm off this thing about not wanting to learn about artemether artesinates, you're gonna be at a big disadvantage. You know, if you are not going into internal medicine, if you're not going into infectious disease or family practice, do you know that this is probably the last time in your entire life you're ever going to study malaria? This is it. If you're going into surgery, if you're going into psychiatry or radiology, pathology, this is probably the last time you're studying treatments from malaria. So suck it up. You're gonna like the way you feel, yeah.